Okay, for this video on Paleo News, we're going to go over two papers here. And one is an example of a, not a well written one, at least when we discuss it in our meeting. And um, I'll explain why. I won't go too far over it. But and the other one's much more interesting, even though it deals with crap. Well, I'll explain that later. All right, first one here is the, oh, here it goes. A heterochronic truncation of odontogenesis in theropod dinosaurs provides insight into the macroevolution of avian beaks. Um, let's see. Um, don't, don't quite immediately read which uh, journal this is, but it's Xiao Wang, Joseph Stiegler, Ping Wu, and, you know, et al. You know, and let's see. <clears throat> now, according to the small section of the significance of this, we identified truncation and tooth development during postnatal ontogeny in two theropod dinosaurs, um, a King Nignathid, um, over Raptosaur, and early Cretaceous bird, Sapiornis. Developmental and paleontological evidence suggests, you know, each suggests dental reduction and beak evolution are coupled. And a sequence of common morphologies is identified that characterizes the multiple transitions to toothless beaks in theropod dinosaurs and birds. Shifts toward earlier cessations and postnatal tooth development can be identified in fish, amphibians, and mammals that are indentulous as adults. Therefore, the identification of similar transitions in multiple Mesozoic theropod dinosaurs lineages strongly implies that heterochronic truncation and, odonto and odontogenesis played an important role in, evolu in the macroevolution of beaks in modern birds. Okay. As that ramble sounded, the problem with this paper, it, when uh, we went to the group, it sums up as this. As a jaw evolves more to a beak, you know, you just can't grow teeth. That's how you basically sum up this paper. It's six pages long. And um, it just sounds, it's just loaded with, um, you know, technical terms all over it. Not well easy to read. Um, it, you know, it's... And many of the people who are, you know, in the meeting there who are graduate students or in the profession itself, and there was only four of us in that meeting, and it's like, this is kind of a duh statement, you know, yeah, well, duh, but it just covers it with a lot of technical jargon. And one of them, sorry, man, it's like somewhere in this paper they discuss about the, um, you know, the platypus, which, because, hey, well, everyone knows that platypus is a duck bill, well, the problem is, is that these guys didn't do their research too well because platypus's beaks aren't beaks the same way bird you know, beaks are. It's sort of it feels leathery. It's actually just a you know a regular jaw, which is a leather cover on it that gives us the impression that it's a duck, you know, a, a bill you know similar to a duck. So again, I don't want to go over too far in this where you know just summation about it as the you know. As teeth grow, as a beak evolves, you know, evolves more to what I said, a beak, you just can't grow teeth. That's just summarizes summarizes that. So we're going to go to the next one here. And of course, as always, I'll link them down below so you can see for yourselves. Now, the next one here is probably a bit more impact here, because when you think of herbivores, well, you think of something that only eats plants. Well, here we have something where, um, uh, um, where you have um, uh, protein in the diet somewhere outside of plants. All right. Consumption of crustaceans by mega herbiv uh, mega herbivorous dinosaurs, dietary flexibility, and dinosaur life history strategies. By um, Carrie Chin, Rodney M. Um, Feldman, and Jessica N. Tashman. Let's see. And scientific reports. This is where it's published. Excuse me, I have a cold. Large plant eating dinosaurs are usually presumed to have been strictly herbivorous because their derived teeth and jaws were capable of process, um, processing fibrous plant foods. 
Um, this inferred feeding behavior offers a generalized view of dinosaur food habits, but rare direct fossil evidence of diets uh, provides more nuanced insights into feeding behavior. Here we describe fossilized feces, corporalites, that demonstrates reoccurring consumptions of, crust of crustaceans and rotted wood by large late Cretaceous dinosaurs. These um, multi-liter corporalites from the Ky uh, Kaparo sorry if I can't pronounce this, Kyparowitz formation are primarily composed of um, comminuted conifer wood tissues that are fungally degraded before ingestion. Thick fragments of um, laminar crustacean cuticles are scattered within the corporate contents and suggest that dinosaurian de um, defecators consume sizable crustaceans that sheltered in rotting logs. This diet of decayed wood and crustaceans offers a substantial supply of plant polysaccharides with added um, dividends of animal protein and calcium. Nevertheless, it is unlikely that the fossilized fecal res residues depict year-round feeding habits. It is more reasonable to refer to these corporates that reflect um, seasonal dietary shifts, possibly related to dinosaur um, oviparous breeding activities. This surprising fossil evidence challenges conventional notions of herbivores, herbivorous um, di dinosaur diets, and reveals a degree of dietary flexibility that is consistent with that of extent um, herbivorous birds. Okay, so they find, um, so Karen Chen, who's, fam who's a fa paleontologist, is famous for studying corpolites with dinosaur dung, because, you know, if you can find some, that could give you insight into the dietary habits of it and whatever animal's eating it. Very difficult, ta more difficult than you think, because first of all, trying to identify something as corpolite is, um, is difficult to do. And then, you know, it, from there on out, just more so. So they find some corpolite in two areas. Um, one, way up, looks like um, northern part of the United States, two medicine formation, and another one in the you know, um, uh, well, um, in the southern part. And then the map they have, map one I show you in the slideshow kind of shows the to two locations, and and it shows it as um, with the inland sea in there, so it gives you an idea. And um, they show pictures of the corpolites, and they discuss um, the contents of it to it. So basically what it is is that they find corporalites that have um, these broken down wood particles but also these crustacean parts as well. Now they look at the dinosaurs found in these areas and they're most likely saying that the the most likely candidate for these would be a hadrosaur like um, Gryposaurus or maybe a Myosaurus. The reason why is that the dental battery, you know the jaw, teeth and all that would be capable of crushing these things. Um, so far, our research hasn't shown too much of um, ceratopsians in that area. Uh, you know, get, you know that doesn't say there aren't any; just haven't been found. So, just based on what all we discovered, what the most likely candidate is. I mean, we found pachycephalosaurs and other hypsilophodonts, but the size of the corporalites and the dental battery between these, you know, just doesn't match something that can um, crush wood and um, and, uh, and the crustaceans that they'll come with it. So. Um, so they also say that the you know the the wood that these came in are fungally degraded, you know before these before the plant eaters get to it the fungal break it down to wood so it makes it easier to chew and within this wood there's crustaceans. Why is this significance? Well, as a herb, if you're a strict herbivore, one of the hard parts about this type of lifestyle is a strong, ready, you know, rich source of protein. Um, that's kind of one of the drawbacks. You have to eat a lot to do, you know, just even get any amount. But here is a instance where they can, you know, at least for one time, because you still have seasons and not everything, and um, so they have to get it right where everything's in place, where you have herbivores eating this wood and therefore in turn getting the crustaceans that, you know, with the proteins and calciums that need. And this is suggested that it may be used to, um, Given these special nutrients, maybe during breeding season, especially in females, where they kind of need um, calcium for eggs, and, and so forth, and protein for obvious reasons. So this is very, um, you know, this you know this can open up a few things. I mean, nothing definite. I think the um, um, she has very conservative, um, you know, um, suggestions. Nothing definite. Nothing on court. So this is the dinosaur that ate it. This is why they ate it. Now it's a case of um, they're most likely, you know. Um, reasons why this corpolite has these wood fibers and these crustaceans in it and this can reflect in the ecology so much more fascinating paper than the other one I just mentioned earlier so there you go I'll link them down below there you know you know 
And uh, that's Paleo News for, for this week. Thank you all for watching. I'll bring out another one in a week or so. You all have a nice day.